The first time I heard him, he reminded me of Moses performing his tricks in the presence of the Egyptians. I found it irritating. The thing in him that captures and retains the attention to such a high degree is, perhaps, a certain mixture of the fantastic, a weird imagination, and a longing for liberty. He is not so much a lunatic as a poseur. His playing is like a musical hors d'oeuvre, a kind of prairie oyster which one swallows down with the aid of pepper and vinegar. But he kept a more private affection for the guitar. And when the guitar appeared, the music was almost always sunnier, gentler, and more intimately revealing. Predictably, this gave rise to the tale that he used the guitar for his sexual conquests, of which there were many. Niccolò Paganini was born in Genoa, in the Passo di Gattamora, the Alley of the Black She-Cat, on the 27th of October, 1782. His father, Antonio, a Genoese dock worker who taught him first the mandolin and guitar, and later the violin. His father gave him also a passion for gambling that would cost him dear in his youth. When success came, he gave that up, but later, with a devilish twist to the tale, gambling was indirectly to cost him even more dearly. But his father taught him also the Genoese skill with money and saw very soon the commercial potential in his child. He put his son to work good and hard, so hard that it took its toll on Niccolo's health, and seemingly for the rest of his days. Paganini said later that it would be difficult to imagine a stricter father. The relationship became complicated. If the boy failed to practice for long hours, he was beaten and given no food. In his battles with the world, which became steadily more serious until the day he died, Paganini was fortunate in having the help of a Genoese lawyer, Luigi Germi, who gave him counsel, took care of his money, and became his most loyal friend and his most devoted correspondent. Unhappily, Paganini did not always follow his friend's advice. In 1814, when he was 32 years old, and already well practiced in escaping from his lovers, he ignored Jeremy's warnings and resisted the claims of a Genoese tailor, Ferdinando Cavanna, on behalf of his pregnant daughter, Angelina. Paganini was arrested and imprisoned for eight days adding fuel to the legend that he had acquired his extraordinary skills through long years in prison for murder. This story haunted him persistently and caused him increasing anguish, because although it did no harm to his quest for gold, it did not at all suit his need for glory and the rising sense of his own importance. Paganini became more and more cautious with women, but in 1824, when he was 42 years old, he began a casual relationship with a soprano, Antonia Bianchi, which was to take an unexpected turn. 
Just as he began to tire of her, Antonia Bianchi announced that she was pregnant and on the 23rd of July, 1825, gave birth to a son. Paganini maintained the relationship in the interests of his child, but refused to marry Bianchi, who became increasingly tempestuous and demanding. For Paganini, as usual, the dream had faded. The relationship collapsed into violence. Bianchi threatened to destroy Paganini's violin, and he demanded a separation. From this time on, he reserved his most intimate affection for his son, to whom he gave the names of no less than three conquering heroes, Achilles, Cyrus, Alexander. And for many years, Paganini gladly fulfilled the roles of father, mother, and nurse. Achilles became, in turn, his closest companion, his aide and translator, and his greatest solace in the suffering that was to come. Paganini took note of the effect and added a new surprise to his repertoire. In time, he would be accused of breaking strings deliberately. Relations with the princess became strained when Paganini seemed to her to be too friendly with her younger and more beautiful sister Pauline, and then appeared at a court concert, resplendent in his uniform as captain of the royal bodyguard. The princess ordered her captain to change into concert dress. Her captain ignored the order. The princess repeated her command. Paganini continued the concert in full regalia, danced with the guests, and then, as he had done before and would do again, took flight to continue his conquest of the Western world. His reputation had long since spread beyond Italy, and he considered traveling further afield. But success had become essential to him, and he waited cautiously for the invitation that he felt he deserved. Eventually, in 1819, when he was 36 years old, it came from the Austrian he Prince Metternich. how a great artist avenges himself. He avenged himself in the manner of a king of the house of Valois. Paganini had made his last grand gesture. He continued to cherish the waning hope of recovery, but died in Nice, suffering pitifully from multiple illnesses, less than a year and a half later, on the 27th of May, 1840. He was 57 years old. But the world had not finished with Niccolo Paganini. His reputation pursued him even beyond his own death and he was denied a Catholic burial. An unsuccessful battle with the Bishop of Nice ensued. His body was embalmed and ferried back and forth by his friends for two years before being buried unofficially on a private estate. It was then exhumed three times before being laid to rest in the Parma Cemetery 36 years later in 1876. It was then exhumed yet again to be reburied in the new Palmer Cemetery a further 20 years later in 1896. What did he achieve in his 57 restless years? He cherished his gift and polished it with intelligence, enthusiasm and tireless hard work. He composed a great range of original and memorable music. He changed violin playing decisively, and he created the age of the romantic virtuoso. 
he fulfilled his mother's dream and wrote his own page in the history of Western music. But parental fanaticism and a suspicious nature made him greedy for success, for gold and for women. And so everything became a battle. He brought the gift of music to hundreds of thousands of people. But he was cavalier and showed little respect for those who so responded to his miraculous gift and conferred on him such enormous privilege. To make matters worse, he made himself extremely rich. And so the world became envious and his attitude exacerbated the envy. Paganini professed indifference and went on to create one of the most enduring legends in all of music. But he used his legend and the world has not forgotten that. And yet, through all of it, he served his demon with commitment and dedication, despite appalling suffering. And in so doing, he changed the world. The world has not forgotten that either. <laughs>